We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. Considering the amount of time and energy we expend on our work, how can you have a meaningful life if your work drains you and leaves you feeling empty? So my question today, how to find a meaningful job or bring meaning into your current work? My witness is Phil Poole, who's a career coach and works with business people to help them create a more meaningful life. He originally trained in computer sciences and worked in software development for the British Museum in London. From there, he moved into project development and helped the BBC and ITV implement cultural change. So, Phil, let me take you back to ITV Hub, their iPlayer system. This was the biggest project of your life. You should have been completely satisfied, but something was wrong. What was going on? So, during this year, I was very aware of, let's say, starting to get bored. You know, bored of the job and the work. And suddenly this big project came along. And rather than being excited by it, I actually had a more of a sense of dread. Like, okay, how am I going to get through this year? And this basically opened me up to kind of start to question, okay, why am I not enjoying this? This should be the pinnacle of something I do in my career. If I'm not going to enjoy this, what am I going to enjoy? And that must have been a little bit frightening, to be perfectly honest. You've been working towards this, and then suddenly they're opening the doors, and you're suddenly thinking, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say frightening because it was so busy, (laughs) you know, that this project was huge, but there was this kind of underlying question that I need to do a deeper change. I need to do something, but I don't know what it is. And for, let's say that, that year or until the project went live, I didn't really have the capacity to answer that. But as soon as it was kind of finished and I went on some much needed holiday, that question started to become much bigger, you know, and I had to really start to figure out how how am I going to answer this? Now, in this podcast, this is the moment when people have a revolution, but it doesn't have to be like that, does it? It can be sort of evolutionary change. Was it revolution or evolution for you? It's more evolution. I do have a couple of big changes that kind of happened. One, which was more a mistake. And then the other, which I'd say was the right approach to kind of go around this this change. But I would say over the last five to seven years, there's been a slow kind of cadence of trying to answer this question, chip away at actually what is it I should really be doing, and then slowly moving towards that. This can be much quicker if you know what you're doing, but I had to figure this out as I was going along. So the important question is, what should I really be doing? I would say the important question is, what gives me joy? Right. So it doesn't matter what you're doing sometimes. It's what is it that gives me joy? What is my purpose? And if you can figure that out, then the work you want to do, the actions you want to do, the job you want to do become very easy to decide at that point. So you need to follow the joy. So how do you know if this is some kind of existential crisis or whether you're just facing the Monday morning blues? You know, you don't fancy getting on the underground and going into work. I think it manifests in two ways. So for me, it was you'd wake up in the morning with a sense of dread on the weekdays. It's like, how am I going to get through this day? And especially as more time went on and I was working on other projects, when you really don't care about them and you need to press a lot of your energy in to make sure that they're working well, you know that there's something going wrong there. For other people, it can be what I call the life of quiet desperation. So you get home tired, you drink, you might have another drink, 
you might empty the gin and tonic bottle by the end of the week, or it could be some other sort of thing, distracting with buying or purchasing or something else. But essentially, you're just trying to distract yourself from the fact you're not really enjoying your life. And then for other people, it can be that explosion. It can be you're burning out and that burnout can be you just can't go on any further or something's going to happen with your family or yourself. And you know that you're just reaching that cliff edge and you can't go any further. Yes, I had a guest on The Meaningful Life. The details will be in the show notes where literally one morning she went to work. She arrived at work and she couldn't actually get out of the car. She just couldn't force herself to get out and go up the stairs. And she went home and went to bed basically for about a month. She just literally couldn't force herself to actually return to work. And in the end, she never went back. Unfortunately, that can actually be quite common. I've also had a burnout and it came about very quickly. I wasn't really aware of it. And then suddenly one day I got some news with work and then I just couldn't face it. What happened? So in terms of the work situation, I found out someone was moving to help me with the project I was going to be working on. And I knew that their help would be an absolute disaster and that there were some other people that would be coming onto the project that would not be helpful either. And it was just the final push to push me over the edge. And there was just something subconscious. It wasn't a conscious decision, but my body just went, no, you just can't keep going like this. And so what did your body do? I basically went into more of a mental shutdown. So I was incredibly exhausted. I then did an experiment and tried to go to the gym and I found I could actually do the gym pretty well. So from a physical point of view, I could go and do something active. But from a mental point of view, I just couldn't really think. I couldn't Mm. make decisions. I was very much pushed I should go on holiday somewhere. And this was during COVID. So it was a bit more complicated to sort that out. And I really struggled to do this. It took me two weeks to get through and be able to make the decision. Not because it was hard, but because my mind just could not do it. So let's imagine somebody listening to this program and they're beginning to sort of think, well, it is possibly more than the Monday morning blues that I've got. Is there a way of actually looking at your job and seeing if you could make it more meaningful? So what I always advise people to do is to actually really try and be mindful about what's going on during your day. So you might hate your job in the holistic sense, but when you break it down into smaller chunks, you can sometimes find these are the bits I really enjoy. So for example, if we go back to the ITV hub, And I was working on this huge kind of project and feeling, you know, very tired and frustrated with it. But when I brought in this mindful aspect to my workday, I suddenly realized I absolutely loved my one-on-ones with my team. And then when I realized that, I realized I loved coaching people. And that was the first signal about what my future career should be. So... You should always bring this mindfulness to really understand what is it I really dislike, but what is it I actually am enjoying, even if I might not be noticing that. But often the things that we dislike are things like office politics and endless meetings and things like that, which we sort of have no control over. Yes. And for those sorts of things, it might be as part of your bigger change, you might you might want to get rid of those. But right in that moment, you might want to take a more stoic view about, okay, what can I control here and what can't I control? And for those things you can't control, how do I choose to react to them? Because, of course, we can get very triggered, very angry, very frustrated, or we can choose a different kind of set of and reactions to that about, okay, how can I get through this without expending too much emotional energy? And what if you've got a sort of, um, how should I put it, a, a good boss who is going to allow you possibly to do more of A and less of B? How do you go around selling this to them? So I think the first thing is you really need to take a step back and figure out what is it I do want to do. So what are my passions? Is it something at my workplace that I really like? And then if that is the case, for lots of people it might not be, but if it is, then you need to look at it from the managers and the businesses side as well. How can you create a win-win situation? So rather than saying, I want to do this or else, 
or basically trying to introduce something that might create lots of pain and issues for people. That's also a win-lose situation. How can you create a situation where it's going to be a win-win and everyone goes, this makes sense? Yes, it might cause us a little bit of hardship, but the benefit is going to outweigh any pain. And in this sort of process, is it useful to sort of look and see where the gaps are in your skills as well as what you can do? Yes. I mean, if we take a step back, I think one of the more important things you can do before even that is to try and figure out, well, where is the joy? And we've spoken a bit about the mindfulness, about where do I get joy during the day? But one of the other things is trying to figure out what are your passions? Now, for some people, they might go, well, that is obvious. Why would you need to figure that out? But for a lot of people, we actually get divorced from our passions, from the things that we really enjoy. And so we actually need to go back to our past, often our childhood or teenage years, and really go, what were the things I really enjoyed? And start to list these down and then move these into adult traits. And this starts to give you an idea of the things that you might enjoy or not. And this might lead you, for instance, that you want to work in a new industry. And then at that point, it's like, well, can I take the skills I have and use them in this new industry? Or do I want to have a completely new job and I have a skill gap here? And then do I need to do training? Because one of the things I found, I mean, I haven't actually worked in a sort of corporate environment for... I don't know, well over 20 years, 25 years, something like that. But what I found was when I was in the corporate world, I used to work in radio. And originally, I used to do very much what I'm doing now, sitting down talking to people on the radio rather than on a podcast. But if you get good at something, you get promoted up the ladder. And so you stop actually doing the things you like and you start supervising the people to do the things you like. And then you get moved up another level and you start having to deal with, I don't know, pension details and interdepartmental stuff. And you're getting further and further away from what it was you actually loved. So what do you do if you realise that actually you've been promoted effectively too high? So one of these things is to just be mindful of it when you're actually doing it. You know, do you love doing the work more than leading people? It's strange. Like, for instance, I do quite enjoy being a manager. I do enjoy helping to grow people. And so that's how I started to go into leadership because I was quite natural and good at it. And that kept on going. But at a certain point, when I'm starting to enter into leadership teams, the politics the narcissism, those were the things I really started to struggle with. And that can often be the case for other people as well, that it might be that you miss the actual doing of stuff, or it might be you actually do enjoy parts of the leadership, or it might be that you just dislike leadership in general, or you dislike the level of leadership you're, you're getting to. And this is always a really hard thing to figure out because ego becomes part of this. You know, we're sort of conditioned by society and the companies we're in that we want to be promoted we want to get to the next we want to get to the next we want to get to the next and at a certain point we sometimes need to make a decision to go i don't actually want the next or where i am now is not where i want to be and i actually want to move down the level but our ego will tell us no do not do this this is failure and this is why that mindfulness and understanding the passion is so critical, because this is another part of you also then speaking to say, actually, you're going to be happier if you do this. And then you can listen to more than one voice to make the right decision. Whereas if you just listen to the ego, you might never make a decision that's going to be based on your happiness. It's going to be based on beating and getting to the next level instead. I'm having trouble actually working out how I can have my ego and talking to, how shall I say, my deeper self. How, how, do you, <laughs> how do you do that? One of the more simple things is literally to sit down when you are alone and actually tr start to try and have a conversation of it. So with um, the ego, you can think of this as the voice that wants to get the next promotion, that wants to be the best and start to figure out, okay, what is it you really want? What are the things you're worried about? Now, this might sound really strange to people, but quite often you will get an answer back. 
you know, it might not be a voice in the head, but you get the information coming in to your head in some way and you can start to write it down. And then you can ask yourself the question, well, what is it I really enjoy? And to start to come back there. Now, for a lot of people that might be burning out who or who've lost sight of their passions, this might be a real struggle. So you need to do things about being mindful about identifying where your joy is, maybe try and figure out where your passions are so you can start to warm that voice up first. Give us some help about warming this voice up, because I can imagine myself finding it really difficult to get this voice up when I worked in the corporate world, because your what gives you pleasure is the last thing on your mind because you've been drummed into efficiency profits the company winning and all of this kind of stuff what do i want is sort of down there at number 57 on the list so what i would suggest is kind of two techniques one is through one week you basically want to go through your day and at the end of each hour you want to remind yourself what have i enjoyed in this last hour And to remind yourself, you want to keep on being mindful to the next hour. And you just want to sort of record this down almost in some sort of journal or a document. So you can then try and figure out what are the things I do enjoy or not. I would advise doing this both in and outside of work and on the weekend as well. So you can get a really good idea. And I can imagine quite a few of my clients saying things like, you know, I feel good when I finish a chunk of work or I feel good when I get a tick from my employer and all of those sort of, how shall I put it, ego stroking sort of kind of events rather than things that actually they intrinsically enjoy. You know, there's a big difference between intrinsically enjoying a piece of work and actually enjoying the fact that you've actually put it to bed. You know, when you finish your taxes, you do feel a moment of joy, but actually doing the taxes gave you no joy at all. I think this is one of the bigger changes of mindset that needs to happen, and especially in Western society. How can I help you have a better relationship? There's nothing I like better than talking to some of the world's top sex and relationship experts. It helps me learn and grow, and that's why I started this podcast. But what makes my life meaningful is writing and teaching. That's why I've written 20 books on relationships which have been translated into 20 languages. They fall into two categories. Firstly, improve your relationships. In this category, I'd like to recommend Happy Couple Handbook, powerful love hacks for a successful relationship. I cover constructive arguing, be a better listener, use carrots rather than sticks, and how to forgive and move on. In the second category, which is called Rescue Your Relationship, I have books like I Love You But I'm Not In Love With You, my international bestseller, Can We Start Again? 50 Questions to Fall Back In Love, My Wife Doesn't Love Me Anymore, and My Husband Doesn't Love Me Anymore and He's Texting Someone Else. You can find out more about these books, along with details about how to get involved with the show and send in your question to be discussed with my guests at my website www.andrewgmarshall.com. We often connect with the goal, the completion of something. So being promoted or finishing the taxes or finishing a project. But living is actually the bits between the goals. So if we only live for the completion of a goal, we're spending very little time actually enjoying ourselves or we're focused on the wrong thing, let's say. Whereas if you can, let's say, reframe your life about, well, how can I achieve the goal in a way I'm really going to enjoy? Then most of your time is spent doing things in a way that makes you happy. And this is actually one of the, let's say, it's one of the key things that can come up for a lot of people that we've been so connected on the goal, the promotion, the something else, that we actually forget to live. Because this trying to live between the goals. This is actually life. This is actually most of our life. And that's the bit that we need to enjoy. It doesn't mean we need to get rid of the goals, but our focus needs to change a bit more on how we actually do that. And I was talking to a client last night who was sort of stuck with work because it was sort of circling round and round in his head, you know, 
one day would be a good day and the next day would be a bad day. And on the bad day, he thinks, oh my God, I'm in the wrong job. I need to be doing something entirely different. And then the next day goes well. And he's so, it's actually very difficult to actually answer these questions because he's cycling through. His mind is probably a little bit too active. Any thoughts on helping people who are stuck in that pattern? Because I think it's quite a common one. So for this, I think one thing is, again, starting to note down what are you enjoying and what are you not enjoying and try and see, you know, where the balance is. Imagine a set of scales. And if you're having more bad days, then perhaps this isn't the right job for you. The other thing to really bear in mind is to look at this in a more infrequent way. So one of my learnings is, okay, every three months, do I feel happier or less happier? Do I feel more confident or less confident? How many regrets do I have? Is it more or less? Because if you look at this in a slightly longer time period, if you're always going, no, I'm less happy, no, I'm having more regrets, you're probably getting a big signal there that this might not be the right job for you. Right. So let's imagine that you're going to be making quite a big change. You know, you've been working as one kind of profession and you want to move into a different field altogether. How do you get other people on board? Because generally, if you're going to change things a lot, it's going to have an impact on your income. It's going to have an impact on the other people in your life. So your partner, maybe your children as well. How do you get other people to buy into it? So on the practical side, I say you really need to look in detail at some of these questions. So let's take the money question. We always would like to have more money, but we can actually go a bit deeper than that to how much money do I actually need? So if I'm going to earn a three-figure salary or more, what am I going to use that money for? Is this possible with the sort of job I have? If I'm going to take a pay cut, what is the minimum we need? You know, and for me, for instance, it's travel. But with someone with a family, there might be some other considerations there. You know, it might be, well, our kids are in private school. Should we take them out? We've got a summer house. Do we want to lose that or not? So you need to really start to look at some of these questions in detail because we can just brush these away and try and pretend they're not there. But a real practical viewpoint of them can be very beneficial. And bringing your partner in with that so they can understand the reasons why it's so important that you change, but also what is the impact on the family life can be really helpful. But I can imagine partners saying you're being selfish. So I think here, part of it is really explaining where you are. So for a lot of people, if you're basically slowly dying inside because you're living a life and having a job that you really dislike, that does have to change. Now, on the surface level, the partner might just say, well, you're taking all these things away from them, the family and me. So you need to go a bit deeper to explain the emotional place that you're in, why you are struggling so much. And if you're talking in this sort of IRA, this is how I am feeling, this is what I really need, rather than saying this is what I need you to do, that can allow the person to understand you much better. So you moved to pursue a meaningful relationship. So you went from one country to another and ended up working for startup companies, which is very different from working from you know big established organizations like the BBC, ITV, British Museum. How did you prepare yourself for that big change? So this is probably one of my bigger mistakes on my own journey. So I didn't really do that much preparation. The big reason for this change was, as you said, to have a relationship with someone. And therefore, I was looking at what was the sort of job I could get in Berlin, especially as I was a non-German speaker. So startups was a very good kind of entryway into the country and into getting good employment. And I also needed someone exactly with my skills. So I didn't really have to retrain. But the trouble was... I was basically saying that my change in life and my happiness was going to come from adding in a relationship rather than changing the underlying issue, which was I was doing the wrong sort of work. Ah, and I think that possibly happens quite a lot. 
we sort of think it's easier to change the relationship than to change the job. Yes, because let's say you want to change your job or you want to change your career. You're going from something that's very well laid out. You know the career steps, you know what you're doing, and you can now change to anything else, to infinite options. And that can be overwhelming for a lot of us, so we get paralyzed by it. But if you're single and start to have a relationship with someone, this feels like a much easier way of answering that question. But you're not answering the question. You know, you haven't actually done anything to change the situation. You're just adding something else in and hoping it's going to solve all of your issues. And that can also be the point, well, let's just take a year sabbatical. Let's just kind of change the location of where we live and I'll still do the same job, but somewhere else. These can all be things we can do to try and change the situation. But what we need to do is look inside us to go, what is the thing that's really going to give me joy? What is the meaningful career for me? Yeah, I know a lot of people over COVID, they moved into the countryside and they thought changing the location would solve the problem. But actually, they were with the same problems and not such good access to buying a pint of milk. Yes, that can be very true. So when did you suddenly realise that you had to do something fundamentally different? So there was kind of two or three main things that kind of happened. So one was realizing that I needed to not focus on a relationship or some of the quick, easy things. I actually needed to look inside myself. And that happened in the first or second year that I was living in Berlin. I was like, I need to do this deeper work in myself to understand what it is I need. Then I actually had some really almost traumatic situations with the workplace that I was in with some pretty terrible things going on that really affected my self-confidence and led to the burnout. And that was the really big pressure that, okay, I need to do some sort of deeper change here. And what was really funny was in the midst of all this, let's say, hardship and toxicity, I actually started to lean into what was my purpose, which, you know, is to help enable and serve people. And one of the ways I could do that was with coaching. And so I offered free coaching during COVID to some people. And I got so much joy from that. Again, there was this big joy. I was like, this is the thing I need to focus on more. And so I started to build this up, do it a bit more, do it a bit more. I'd changed jobs. I wasn't quite ready to go full time into being a coach just yet. And then, then the final thing was that there was some changes going on in this workplace, which was much better. But I very objectively looked at it and with these changes, I realized I was going to spend at least six months working 60, 70 hours a, a week. And that was when I had to really make the decision. It's like, do I want to do these 67 hours? Do I want to try and find a new job that has less hours? Or do I now want to make that leap to actually do my purpose? And that's quite an interesting thing you talk about there. You actually did it not for money at the first. You sort of experimented with it and saw if this was really what you wanted to do rather than leaping first and then looking afterwards. And this is something I always advise my clients to do. You must do experiments, have experiences to build up your confidence that you're on the right path. It can be very tempting to do the big leap or it can be very terrifying to do the big leap, but we just want to, let's say, get the certainty of the the, um, decision. What can be much better is to take small step by small step. We sort of know what our passions are. We know what the change might be. Let's do some experiments and have experiences to really validate that. And that will either build your confidence up more, or it will very quickly prove that you're doing something completely that you don't want to do. And then you can go back and look at some of your other passions instead. So often they talk in the business world of branding yourself. Is branding yourself part of all of this? Can this help towards finding a meaningful work or getting more meaning in your work? I would look at this in two different levels. So one is, who are you? And so that's doing the deeper question about who am I? What are my values? What are my beliefs? What are my passions? What is my purpose? And if you can really figure that out and really integrate it into you, like, this is me. I'm not talking about another random person. This is me. You can almost come out and go, this is who I am as a person. And that can really help in giving you the confidence to move forward. 
You kind of mentioned about speaking with a partner or a spouse and there could be issues here. A lot of other people can have issues with their social network or their network in general. So really understanding who you are and knowing that with confidence then allows you to come out and say that to all of these people without feeling shame. And quite often these people will then support you as well. The other thing is, let's say you have found a new industry or a new career you want to do, then you do also need to brand yourself to fit into that new industry or to that new career. So that's going to networking events. How do you change your resume? Kind of like, how do you change your LinkedIn feed? How do you want to brand yourself with that? So you look like a good, compelling person that people want to talk to or recruit you. You should not do the branding without really understanding yourself and doing the coming out first. The branding is just the surface, the top of the iceberg. You need to do the deeper work underneath the water first. So to give us a sort of idea of this deeper work, because I'm I'm a little sort of confused, help me. Um, who, Who am I? How do I answer that question? Ask me some questions to help me with this. So the way that I always look at this is, what are your values? What are your strengths? Okay, what are my values? Mm. I mean, one of my strengths, I'll do the strengths. I mean, I'm, I'm quite a good listener. I'm curious. I suppose I want to help people and help them meet their potential. And let me just stop you there. So the way you've answered that is probably... Better than how most other people could. Most oh, people right. know I have, uh, I will have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> there is actually a website that has a survey that I really recommend to people, which is the Creative Via Strengths. And we can add those into the show notes. And I always get people to do this survey. And what sort of questions they ask in the survey then? It's sort of like a personality survey. It takes about 15 minutes, but then it kind of tells you what your top strengths are and your lower strengths are. Now, this might not be accurate, but what I found is when you have a piece of paper that gives you stuff in order, you can then start to edit it and change and go, well, that's not quite right. That's not quite right. But rather than the blank piece of paper, which is so hard to answer like you have just seen, you've then got this list that you can actually edit and change yourself. What you can also look with these is like, which has an emotional resonance with me. So your top strengths or your top values are the ones where you should find yourself getting more angry. So for instance, I have a very strong value and strength of fairness. And I find that when I perceive something to be unfair, I will get very annoyed and angry. And that is always a sign that this is a very important strength for me. And actually hearing you start putting these labels forward is actually quite helpful because I'm thinking, actually, I'm also quite creative as well. I hadn't put that in the list. So I can see, I can see how these kind of lists are going to be very useful. And as Phil says, we'll put those details into the, the show notes. The other important thing is if you look at the passions. So what did you do in your childhood or as a teenager? And then look at why Because sometimes you can say, well, I like books or I like drawing or I like to create worlds in my head. But then you need to go that level deeper to go, well, what did I really enjoy about doing this? And if you do this for the hobbies and the interests that you can remember, you often start to see quite a strand of some of your values and things there. So for instance, I have a lot of people who go back and then find that they had these really creative kind of interests. And kind of 20, 30 years later, they now believe that they're not a creative person. And it's sort of life and their career has moved them into the point that they don't think they are creative. But if you go back, they were hugely creative people and they've just lost sight of that. And how would they use these creative skills in the modern workplace? So part of it is understanding what's there first. So we might not all be creative, we might have something else. But then it's, okay, how do I like to use my creativity? Perhaps you do use it at the moment. So one of the things I was always very good at is with strategy, because it's a really complex thing to try and solve. For me, that was quite a creative mindset to go, well, these are all of the problems. These are what all the people want. How can we create something that's going to serve that? And so in a career setting, that was one of the ways I was able to engage with my creativity. 
So really, we can actually look at all these worlds in a much broader sense than we we did as children, because creative meant, you know, drawing a picture and putting it on the wall. And that's probably not going to be a career for everybody. But you can actually use that creativity in a whole range of different ways if you uh, look deeper into it. Exactly. Quite often, how do you like to solve problems? Are you someone that likes novel problems? Or are you someone that likes a repeatable pattern? that kind of allows you to figure out perhaps creativity can be in problem solving or not. Perhaps it's around helping people because when you work with people, they're always complex. Perhaps it's around some sort of skill. So let's say you're a marketing person. How do you do that? Now, another thing you suggest is having a conversation with fear. Now, I can see why fear might be holding you back from making this change, because it's all very comfortable doing more of what you're doing, and to move to something more meaningful is going to bring around a lot of fear. So how do you have a conversation with fear? With fear, quite often our impulses are to fight fear or to run away from it. And for this, I'm talking about the deeper fear. So quite often we have this when we're on a roller coaster or watching a horror movie. But when it comes to making a big change in our life, this can really frighten us on a much deeper level because there are so many unknowns. And rather than fighting or running away from it, you actually need to embrace it as a friend. Sit down have a glass of wine or a cup of tea with it and start to have a conversation. And with this, what you really need to do is, okay, what are the main things I'm frightened of? And so with what we're talking about here, what are the main things I'm frightened of with this change? And write down that list. And then for each item in that list, go a bit deeper. What am I really frightened of? Could it be something else? This is the surface fear, but there's a deeper one further below. And then you kind of look at that and go, okay, if the worst was to happen, what would that be? How would I mitigate that? How can I actually prevent it now? And if you do that with each of those things, you're basically going and having a really detailed conversation with fear. It sort of turns into a friend that's telling you lots of stuff, but you remain within the driving seat to make the decisions about what it is you want to do next. For myself, I do this every six weeks. Now, I kind of go through all of my fears, really have a questioning kind of approach with them. I normally have a set of actions at them and the end of that, but I always feel very calm and centered because I have really gone deep to understand what's going on in me at this time and how do I want to take the next steps forward. So what did fear say to you the last time you checked in with it? So one of the big ones for me and This is really interesting because it's come up now for almost a year. And that is that, you know, am I going to be successful? Am I going to keep on being successful? And when I go a bit deeper, there's two fears. One is I'm going to fail. But the other one is I'm going to have to go back and have a normal job. Mm. And it's really interesting. The moment I break it down to that, the fear starts to actually die down because rather than, am I going to be successful or not? I can start saying, do I have to get a new job or not yet? And the answer is no, you are doing well. All of the facts and figures show things are going really well. But I can also do some reassurance. Well, okay, if you are going to get a new job, you know this would be your approach to do that. So you've learned some things that would, if you did have to go back and get a, what I used to always call a proper job, then you would approach it in a very different way than the way you approached it in the past. Exactly. And what's interesting with this fear I've shared is it comes up every time. It's not like you do this process and it goes away. But what happens is I can reassure myself when it turns into a louder voice again. Because fears are irrational. They're not logical. So it's normal that some of them are going to keep on coming up again and again. Yeah. And our natural approach to fear is to run away from it. And when you run away from it, you really don't know what it is. I remember once watching, have you ever seen um, Jurassic Park? Yes. And I saw that twice because... um, I uh, didn't want to tell some some friends that I'd actually already seen it, but uh, I, I couldn't wait. 
So I ended up seeing it twice. And the first time round, every time some monster was about to leap round the corner, I closed my eyes. And it was absolutely terrifying because I didn't actually see what happened next. The second time round, I was less frightened. And so I kept my eyes open. And in fact, what happened in my brain was a thousand times worse than actually what happened on the screen. And in a sense, that's a little bit like how we approach life. We close our eyes and we imagine all these terrible things. If we keep them open, generally, it's never nearly as bad as all our fears are. Exactly. The moment we run or try and hide from fear, it gets bigger and bigger. I kind of think of it like this shadow that gets darker and darker. But if we actually walk towards it, we might just find it. This is how I picture it now, but as a small teddy bear, that's there to kind of help you. And I really like using this because from this huge looming shadow monster to a small cute teddy bear, that's how much fear can transform when you really do approach it and use it in a useful way and kind of basically embrace it as a friend that's trying to help you. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. Let me tell you about my Substack newsletter, because I'd love my Meaningful Life listeners to subscribe. The newsletter is a mix of relationship advice and my thoughts about building a meaningful life. You can find everything at themeaningfullife.substack.com, so please do sign up. Details will also be in the show notes. If you go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts, you'll find that there's ways of participating in the program. You could, for example, tell us about a dilemma that you're currently facing, and I will find a suitable guest to advise you. Now, I've had one letter that seemed to be suitable for two guests. So I decided I would get two very different approaches. Um, It's going to be fascinating to see if what um, Phil has to say is very different from what Celia Dodd had to say when uh, she was doing the program on uh, helping navigate through your life with your adult children. My son, for all the years I've known him, has been a gentle, kind and compassionate person. He's academic and was considering philosophy at university, but began losing interest in school during lockdown. He's reluctantly halfway through A-levels and not enjoying it. He is, however, heavily into the TV series Peaky Blinders, and his best friend, who I'll call Jack, is obsessed with mixed martial arts fighting, spending hours every day training. Jack has a lot of anger concerning his dad, who's financially well-off, and left his mum to raise Jack in poverty. My son and Jack are now dead set on joining the military, specifically the Royal Marines, when they finish school. Peaky Blinders glorifies brutal, merciless male violence and lionises military service. It is a recurrent theme that those who have had not been soldiers are cowards, and those encountering PTSD are mentally unhinged, dangerous, and morally inferior. My son will be 18 in a few months. He's currently a full-blown lad, and I can't stop him from applying from the trap of joining the military. He doesn't have any awareness of his own emotional immaturity. So, this is, um, I think, actually really about finding meaningful work at the bottom of it, because that's what we want for our children. Uh, What if we think we know better than they do what is meaningful? Well, this is always the issue. At a certain point, we're not in charge of the decisions for them. So it's how can we help them to make good decisions instead? Now, for this specific example, I think it's quite natural to say, well, how can I stop them from doing this? But if we say about experiments and experiences, how could you create safe experiments to allow his son to actually explore that lifestyle and that career more without him having to make the decision. Weekend boot camps, army training for children or teenagers. And these are all things that could be done to allow the son himself to inform himself about what is the actual consequence, what is the life actually like that he's going to choose. 
I would also say there's something about being really practical about the reality of it. Like the Royal Marines is not the easiest part of the army to get into. It has some quite rigorous qualifications and also kind of doing that more factual thing. Well, are you doing the training for this? Are you going to be able to do it? What is the training you need to do? And again, that could be part of the experiencing because this all then creates a true reality for the son to explore and play in, but also allows the son to take the responsibility then to make their decisions rather than it turning into a power play between father and son. And um, actually, I think in some cases, the military will pay for people to go to university. So you, you join, but you actually get the university education. It's strange, like some of my first jobs were around defence and um, contracting. And there were a lot of people that had been in the Navy or the Army or the Marines. And basically, it had really helped set them up to have very successful careers after they had chosen to leave. It's also worth saying that the Army and Navy in general, and especially the Royal Marines, there's a number of values there about kind of structure, integrity, discipline, bettering yourself, good leadership. And these are all incredibly good things that you can learn from such a situation as well. And some of these very large organisations have really quite good career guidance within them so that you're in the right element of it because the military is a very complex world and so there are thousands of different niches within it. It's not just running up the beaches at three o'clock in the morning with camouflage gear on, is it? No, there's all sorts of things you can do. So depending on your aptitude, you can go down some very different paths. So I think we've got some ego involved here, both from the parents and from the child or the son. I don't think we want to call him a, a child now at um, heading forwards 18. How do we get the ego out of the way? Because, you know, to get the uniform, I think that's a big ego thing. For the parents, getting what they think is right can also be an ego thing too. How are we going to get the ego out of this? So I think one of the things is just trying to set up experiences so rather than you must or must not do this, okay, how about we set up things that you can go and explore this more? We give you the responsibility then to see how much you like it or not. And so rather than it being an I or you, it's like, let's trust you to have some of these experiences and then know what is best. The other thing is just to take it into a very objective way. Okay, what are the pros? What are the cons? And rather than doing this in a subjective way on what I believe or what you believe, you know, use some of the more impartial sources, which would probably include the MOD, because especially for the Royal Marines, they want people that really are suited to kind of do that. I wouldn't be surprised, I haven't checked this, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if they even have like a trial kind of period as well, because the lifestyle is so different. So, you know, enabling some of these things, these experiences and the objectivity takes a lot of the you or me out. But I think there's also a big thing here about creating experiences to trust the son to make the right decisions rather than cut him off from all of the data, from all of the experiments and experiences he could have. So he then makes this decision blind, maybe just based on the fact that the parents don't want him to do it. Thank you for that, Phil. If you'd like to write in to us, it's www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts. So, Phil, thank you very much for being a witness on The Meaningful Life today. I have to turn the tables on you and ask, what makes your life meaningful? For me, it's enabling and serving people. So very much helping them find the authentic life for them that gives them joy. So we're going to say that, unfortunately, this is where the conversation ends, unless you are a supporter of The Meaningful Life. And if you want to hear the bonus material, which is going to be how to find out who I am and what I really want, we're going to dive deeper into that particular question. If you want to hear this bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We are also available on Amazon Music. If you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and get access to all of this goodies, here comes the details. 
You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.